Hello, let me start with uh, thanking the organizers for this opportunity. Today, I'm going to be talking about uh, distributed fiber optic sensors, specifically Bruon distributed fiber optic sensors, which have been uh, gaining a lot of uh, attention over the past uh, couple of decades for a variety of applications, specifically in uh, structural health monitoring. And the specific uh, type of distributed, uh, Bruon distributed sensor that I'll be talking about is uh, what is called Bruon optical correlation domain analysis. And uh, what is the uh, work that we have been doing uh, recently? We have been enabling this uh, multi-point sensing, especially uh, simultaneous uh, multi-point sensing in this uh, Bruan optical correlation domain analysis. And that is through a technique what we call as externally modulated BOCDA. And uh, more specifically, I'll be also looking at uh, how to accurately estimate what is called this Bruan frequency shift, which is actually a measure of uh, a strain or temperature uh, in these sensors. Uh, so let me first start with thanking uh, my uh, uh, co-authors, uh, Bhargav, uh, Yashwant, our uh, PhD students uh, that did most of the work, and Deepa and Uday, our uh, colleagues at the Department of Electrical Engineering at IIT Madras, and my name is Balaji Srinivasan. I should also acknowledge uh, IIT Madras as well as the Department of Information Technology, uh, Government of India for uh, their funding and support. So let's uh, start with uh, a brief motivation of uh, why we need these uh, Bruan uh, optical sensors, distributed sensors. Um, so when we talk about uh, distributed sensing, uh, specifically, let's look at this uh, uh, you know, distributed strain sensing, which is actually uh, very useful for a variety of applications, specifically structural health monitoring of uh, bridges, dams, airplanes, uh, ships, et cetera. Now in all these uh, cases, the um, timely intervention uh, can save a lot of dollars. Uh, so uh, essentially we need to be monitoring these structures and uh, trying to see if there are any defects developing. One example of that is uh, what's shown over here. This is actually a oil or gas pipeline on which uh, you could possibly run uh, optical fibers and these could possibly be looking at any uh, defects that are developing in the structures over uh, ranges in the order of hundreds of kilometers with uh, one meter resolution. Uh, there are already commercial uh, Bruan distributed sensors, uh, specifically a technique that's called Bruan optical time domain analysis uh, that is quite useful for uh, these uh, sort of applications. But there is another set of applications. Um, for example, you know, uh, structural health monitoring of an aircraft where the typical um, ranges are only in the order of 100 meter, but the resolution, the spatial resolution that you need in these applications are in the order of tens of centimeters. And uh, of course, uh, what you also would prefer is that uh, it can uh, pick up uh, dynamic events, um, say vibrations, uh, impact monitoring, and, and so on. So how do we do this uh, using this uh, Bruan uh, scattering in this optical fibers? Uh, so let's spend a, a couple of slides. I, I, uh, you know, uh, uh, beg your pardon if uh, you know you're already very well versed with some of this, but uh, maybe there are some people in the audience who are not having uh, required background to understand BOCDA. So I'm going to start with uh, just explaining how this uh, Bruan sensing works, and then how uh, Bruan optical time domain analysis works because that's uh, more common and then we'll go into BOCDA. So that's what I'm gonna to try to do in the next couple of slides. So let's go back and uh, revisit uh, the Bruon OTDA, in general, uh, the Bruon uh, sensing concept. 
So here I'm just showing a zoomed version of an optical fiber, let's say core of an optical fiber. So if you launch a narrow line with laser radiation into it, uh, you're going to uh, have some scattering through this uh, acoustic phonons in, this, in the glass medium. And uh, that scattering is what we call as Bruan scattering. When it interacts with this uh, uh, incoming radiation, it's gonna uh, set up a, a standing wave pattern in terms of the fields. And uh, that standing wave pattern through electrostriction can uh, essentially uh, enhance the scattering when the input uh, uh, signal is uh, beyond a certain power level, right? Uh, this is typically called the Bruan pump. And this is the uh, Stokes uh, scattering that we are looking at. The interesting aspect is, of course, that um, the uh, backscattered uh, frequency is nu naught minus nu b, where bru uh, nu b corresponds to the Bruan frequency. And the Bruan frequency depends on the velocity at which uh, uh, acoustic waves travel in this uh, medium. And uh, we know that is actually dependent on the density of the medium, which in turn is sensitive to any strain or temperature perturbation. So um, any changes in strain or temperature will change this acoustic velocity and through that uh, will change the backcattered frequency. Essentially, we are trying to pick up this uh, backcattered uh, Bruan frequency. That's what we call as the Bruan frequency shift. And uh, that, uh, you know, if it's monitored as a function of position, will actually give you a map of uh, strain or uh, temperature along the length of the uh, fiber. And of course, it helps to know that uh, if you actually send in a probe radiation from the other end, that can actually stimulate this uh, Bruan process. And uh, then it can resonantly enhance the, um, the probe radiation depending upon whether the Bruan gain is actually having the uh, right frequency corresponding to the probe frequency. Um, so how this is actually implemented in BOTDA, uh, what we typically do is we send a pulse of light from one end of the fiber uh, while you have a continuous uh, radiation at uh, nu naught minus nu B uh, launched from the other end, that's what we call as the probe. And then you actually look at the amplified probe uh, using a, a, a photodiode. And when you look at the amplified probe, it's, it's a relatively high intensity at certain parts and certain other regions where there are perturbations, they would not actually have uh, amplification. That's because of the fact that this uh, Bruan process, amplification process is not resonant at, uh, uh, at these uh, perturbation points. Now, of course, if you want to figure out the Bruan frequency at those points, uh, what you tend to do is to launch uh, different uh, probe frequencies. And if we keep doing that uh, one by one, you can actually uh, figure out the uh, Bruan gain at each of those frequencies. And finally, you get a map that looks like this which is a frequency, this is a Bruan frequency shift, BFS in short, as a function of position. And uh, based on the magnitude of this, you can actually correlate uh, you know, to a particular strain or temperature value. So that's what a BOTDA is about. Now, how do you implement BOTDA? Well, you typically take a narrow band uh, laser, you amplify that uh, uh, to a certain level, typically in the order of 20 dBm, and then you launch it into, uh, uh, you, you split it into two waves. One is actually used to generate your probe and that is using uh, this electro-optic modulator. Uh, uh, you can basically uh, generate these uh, sidebands, a new naught plus mu b and new naught minus mu b. And uh, then the other uh, side, you actually send in your uh, pump uh, which is uh, pulsed through this electro-optic modulator. And then you look at the backscattered signal uh, at each frequency. So for one frequency, you get one trace and then you start changing your uh, 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 probe frequencies and you get this entire map over here. And clearly in this map, uh, you can see perturbations, let's say corresponding to strain in this uh, fiber under test. 
and uh, and it clearly tells you how much is the magnitude of the strain that's by uh, you know that's uh, uh, achieved uh, using the brown frequency shift and also the location of this perturbation so that works great uh, for certain applications like we talked about uh, for example monitoring of uh, bridges dams uh, maybe uh, monitoring of oil gas pipelines also over uh, you know literally hundreds of kilometers of fiber um, but however when you are trying to do this over short distance and especially if you need to actually do this uh, at a fairly fast rate i'm talking about looking at perturbations in the order of 100 hertz that is typically not uh, uh, easily achieved using a botda type of approach and that's where we are going towards uh, bocda uh, type of approach in which um, essentially you have two counter propagating waves um, that are going into this uh, fiber one is called the pump wave and the uh, probe wave and let's say the probe wave is about uh, uh, you know uh, frequency shifted by about 11.10.8 gigahertz which is uh, uh, corresponding to the brown frequency shift in uh, in silica fibers um, if they are frequency modulated at sent into the fiber they actually uh, counter propagate and they create uh, uh, an interaction which uh, looks like this wherever they are meeting they are essentially uh, creating gain and everywhere else they don't actually produce so much gain so these are actually the different uh, gain peaks uh, that you achieve in the fiber now um, what is important to note is that uh, these peaks are uh, inversely proportional to the frequency of modulation of the wave that you are uh, sending in and uh, and then the width of this uh, peaks correspond to uh, in, you know inversely they are dependent on the frequency modulation as well as the frequency deviation uh, that you have uh, over here now so this allows you to pick up any changes in strain at, at these particular point and typically you design um, uh, the uh, modulation frequency such that only one of those peaks are uh, uh, at, uh, existing within this uh, sensing fiber okay um, now if you want to actually change the position of the peak what you need to do is actually go to a slightly different modulation frequency and uh, if you do that uh, what we can see is the zeroth order position doesn't change but the first order and higher order um, those positions are changing as a function of changing this modulation frequency so if you choose one of these orders you can actually um, look at different positions uh, you know what you can you can uh, essentially confine uh, uh, localize the interaction at different positions and uh, through that you can actually uh, figure out what is the strain or temperature changes at uh, at those positions okay um, so this is what bocda is all about and uh, uh, like like we said we will be looking at one of the higher order so how do you implement this um, well we'll come back to that in a minute but what is the what is the problem as of uh, today um, with with the existing techniques there are several techniques that are available one is actually called the random access bocda in which the uh, fm signal the fm modulation signal is switched between uh, different positions and so essentially you can you can randomly choose whichever position you want to monitor and you can switch between them and that's actually uh, something that has been demonstrated by uh, hotate and his group now then there is another technique which is called temporal grating uh, bocda where you allow multiple uh, peaks but they are all gated in time which means that you can actually read information from only one particular uh, position at any uh, at, at any time so uh, so that that's what a, a temporal grating abuse uh, is all about but what we are interested in is actually to have uh, independent tuning of these uh, regions where we want to monitor and uh, maybe 
possibly here we are showing only two positions, but maybe you want to independently monitor, say, eight positions across the length of the fiber and simultaneously achieve, uh, 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 you know, get information from them. So how do we achieve this? Well, that is actually achieved using what is called a face modulated BOCDA. Essentially, you take a narrow line with a laser, but you employ an external face modulator so that you can uh, achieve all your uh, frequency modulation. And here the beauty is that you can uh, have different modulation frequencies all uh, modulated simultaneously on this uh, optical carrier. And uh, this is what we are showing here. Let's say we are looking at two different frequencies, FM1 and FM2. And uh, when we uh, actually uh, modulate it, you, you get these uh, two, uh, so this is the RF uh, signals that are sent, uh, that are uh, fed to the mod face modulator, and you get these uh, uh, optical outputs. You choose um, one side band using a bandpass filter, and then uh, with that side band, uh, let's say you choose the frequency such that you are looking at two different uh, uh, positions along the fiber, and then if you want to change the position, you just change one of those uh, frequency values while the other modulation frequency is kept the same. So you can independently uh, tweak this uh, position with respect to uh, this position. Um, so let's go into the implementation part of it. Like we talked about, uh, what's different about this setup compared to the previous setup is now I have a laser and then uh, output of which is going through a face modulator and the face modulator is uh, driven using an RF generator. So you start with one uh, carrier frequency, but then when you modulate with this uh, RF uh, radiation, you get these uh, two sidebands and you pick one of those sidebands using the uh, bandpass filter and then um, you know, you can, you can actually uh, uh, modulate uh, with respect to the frequency of interest, the Bruan frequency of interest. So you are uh, uh, converting to that uh, particular frequency and generating the probe, whereas the pump uh, will essentially have uh, this, uh, you know, around, around the carrier frequency itself. So both of these are interacting with each other. So they are corresponding to two different positions in the uh, fiber under test. And uh, uh, to verify that they are actually producing two different frequencies, we actually follow uh, uh, work uh, that we have uh, published in this paper, which is essentially send a pulse of light just to get this interaction and, and then map out the uh, Bruan gain at, uh, at, at various positions. So when we do that, what we find is, uh, uh, you know, so we could, we could actually, uh, corresponding to do these two uh, FM frequencies uh, in a one kilometer long uh, fiber under test, we can clearly see uh, two peaks. And uh, then uh, when we change, uh, we, uh, we keep FM2 that is corresponding to this peak uh, constant. And when you change FM1, you can clearly see that the Bruan peak is changing. And uh, similarly, you can uh, keep FM1 constant that is corresponding to uh, this peak over here. And then you can vary uh, the uh, FM2 and uh, you can, you can uh, show that uh, they, these could be independently varied. Okay, now going on to the results of this. Um, so we can achieve basically, you can pick up FM1 and FM2 uh, separately uh, by looking at uh, lock-in detection. And uh, we do lock-in detection as the two times FM frequency uh, because that will be a very clear indication uh, that it's, it's coming from uh, any perturbation related to uh, this uh, modulation frequency that we are sending in. So uh, we can show that, uh, you know, when you're uh, looking at uh, one position, let's say at, at this position in this one kilometer fiber, there is uh, with strain applied in this other section, we don't see any variation in the uh, Bruan frequency. But uh, when you look at the, uh, the, the peak uh, corresponding to what, what we have localized in the 100 meter, 
section, you can clearly see that it's uh, sensitive to uh, different strain values. Now we have moved this to a dynamic uh, configuration where we are switching between two fibers with uh, different Bruan frequencies. And once again, we see that the Bruan frequency corresponding to this peak here, this FM uh, frequency is constant, whereas here it's actually uh, changing at the rate at which we are switching between these two fibers. And, uh, uh, you know, we have moved it on to uh, switching time of one second. And, uh, uh, and, and once again, uh, we moved on to uh, switching to uh, speed of 150 um, millisecond. And we can clearly see that we are able to pick up this Bruan frequency as a function of uh, this uh, switching time. Um, just to show that it's not actually limited by switching time, we have gone on to switching speeds in the order of uh, 10 millisecond that corresponds to 100 hertz. And we can clearly see the corresponding um, uh, switching happening in the uh, fiber under test. So that actually demonstrates that we could uh, pick up uh, uh, you know, uh, information from two different locations uh, by, uh, by using this external phase modulation. But in all these uh, techniques in typical BOCDA measurements, there is one issue. The issue is the accurate estimation of uh, BFS in, in BOCDA. And that is because of the fact that the Bruan gain is not localized, uh, not only localized at the correlation location, but it's uh, more of an integral of the gain uh, with the correlation uh, the beat spectrum corresponding to the correlation. To give you an idea, uh, if you look at this uh, beat spectrum that corresponds to this uh, uh, component here, we are expecting only one peak um, at, a, at a particular location at a particular frequency, but you see some residuals at other frequencies and uh, other correlation, non-correlation locations. Okay, and this is actually a major uh, problem because it actually gives you a very large background and because of which uh, picking up this peak may be challenging under certain circumstances. So we'll look into this in a little more detail. One way of actually uh, deconvoluting uh, this uh, beat spectrum is by a linear approximation of the Bruan gain. Uh, we know that the Bruan gain is typically exponential, but if you could actually linearize it at, uh, at uh, you know, low, uh, small signal conditions so that you can write them as the exponential as one plus GB into uh, PPU, then you could uh, possibly uh, get, uh, you can deconvolve uh, this beat spectrum and, and get the original uh, Bruan frequency shift. And that's what we are demonstrating here. This is actually the measured spectrum, which has a very large background, but then you could do this deconvolution that, that we are talking about here, and you can estimate the frequency very, very clearly. But it becomes very challenging when your event uh, perturbation has generated a very small peak over here, which is actually less than the background peak uh, that's available in other uh, portions of the fiber, but we see that uh, this technique is able to pick up even in those cases. Now we have extended this for uh, multiple realization. We have done a Monte Carlo analysis and we have extended for multiple realizations. And we do see that uh, we are able to pick up uh, this uh, Bruan frequency with errors less than one uh, megahertz over a wide range of uh, Bruan frequencies at different correlation locations and all that. However, if we try to do this for the 2FM component, um, it is actually not uh, so easy to do that. And we do see a large error in that component. Uh, so, so that's because of uh, the fact that the phase is actually not tracked when, when we uh, do this conventional direct, uh, detection. And for that, we have actually uh, gone on to look at a gradient descent algorithm, wherein uh, we simulate uh, the BGS, that's a Bruan gain spectrum for uh, different values of uh, BFS. And then we compare with the measured uh, BGS uh, spectrum 
and through that we uh, get an error value, a mean square error value, and that error is what we are trying to minimize. So essentially, uh, you start with the initial guess, uh, but as you change this uh, frequency um, FBO, then you can you can actually uh, get uh, uh, the get to the you know right uh, Brouwer frequency. And uh, this has been verified at different uh, signal to noise ratio levels, and uh, we see that it's it's capable of picking the Brouwer frequency very accurately in this case. And this uh, we have be verified once again with a Monte Carlo analysis um, with multiple realizations, uh, with multiple locations of this uh, Brouwer uh, uh, this this perturbation. And uh, we see in all of this, uh, we are able to pick up uh, the uh, BFS accurately within uh, two megahertz uh, 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 accuracy. And uh, of course, if we just take a slice across at one particular location, let's say 500 meters, and we look at that, uh, even with levels as low as 5 dB uh, signal to noise ratio, we are able to pick up the BFS with uh, less than two megahertz um, uh, accuracy. So in summary, uh, the takeaway points here are one, uh, we can achieve multi-point sensing, simultaneous multi-point sensing using external modulation. And uh, that is uh, through this phase modulation method that we talked about with dedicated lock-in channels. And, uh, and, and then if we could, if we want to do the accurate estimation of BFS by doing deconvolution, linear approximation works under certain conditions, but uh, what we have demonstrated is gradient descent algorithm works even better. And we have been able to uh, look at uh, BFS error of less than one megahertz over 500 megahertz range and signal to noise ratio as low as 5 dB. Um, and these have been validated with experimentally obtained values. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that you might have.